good evening everyone. Good evening everyone. Good evening everyone. All good? All right. Um, I'd like to welcome you to Melbourne University Health Initiative's third public lecture for 2014. My name is Stefan and I work as part of the public lectures team here at MUHI alongside Jordana. In our first two public lectures for the year, we were inspired by Professor Ingrid Sheffer's work in epilepsy, Tim Conlon, who's Australia's local hero for 2014, and his work with children's um, emotional wellbeing at the Children's Hospital. But tonight we'll be shifting gears. Tonight we'll be discussing infectious disease, in particular HIV. Our guest speaker is Professor Sharon Lewin, who is the Director of the Infectious Disease Unit at the uh, Alfred Hospital, Professor of Medicine at Monash University, the Co-Head for the Centre of Biomedical Research at the Burnett Institute, and lastly, the inaugural Director of the Peter Doherty Institute across the road on Graddon Street. Tonight's public lecture could not have come at a better time, with the highly anticipated 20th International AIDS Conference taking place here in Melbourne in July of this year, which Sharon will be the co-chair of. Sharon's laboratory focuses on understanding how HIV persists in patients on antiviral therapy, the biological determinants of immune recovery following antiviral therapy, as well as strategies to cure HIV infection. Like all of our public lectures this year, um, tonight will require a gold coin donation on your way out, all of which will be donated to the Victorian AIDS Council, which does lots of great work in our community with people who live with HIV through education, prevention, treatment, care, and counselling also. Um, at the end of um, Sharon's lecture, she'll be happy to take um, some questions from the audience tonight, so if you do have them, um, write them down and um, she'll be happy to answer them later on. I'd also like to um, quickly let you know that tonight we'll have a live Twitter feed, so if you are in the Twitter sphere, our hashtag tonight is hashtag CureHIV, and our Twitter handle is MU underscore health. I won't bore you any longer, so it's my great pleasure tonight to invite Professor Sharon Lewin. Thank you, Stefan, for the kind introduction. And um, looking out in the audience, I can see I've got a very uh, diverse audience. I can see some um, very expert virologists in the room and uh, some expert HIV prevention scientists. And I can see lots of young faces of, um, I assuming, budding doctors or public health specialists or science students. So. Um, it's a big audience, it's a broad audience, and I want to talk to you about um, what's happened in HIV, how the world has changed for people living with HIV, and uh, what we're thinking we might be able to achieve um, in the future. So I'm going, to, I'm going to assume you don't know anything about HIV and, and share some of the excitement of what those great changes have been. So without a doubt, um, the biggest advance in HIV medicine has been the discovery of antiretroviral therapy, which became available at least in high-income countries in 1996 and transformed HIV from a universal death sentence to a chronic manageable disease. And over the last 20 years or so, um, treatment has just got better and better. So on the left is what treatment was like um, when I first started my career as infectious disease physician, and on the right is what people with HIV take now, a single tablet a day that contains usually a mix or three um, anti-HIV drugs. Resistance is rare, um, side effects is rare. Treatment has become um, incredibly cheap due to sort of global mobilization of patient groups working together with pharmaceutical companies to make treatment now available to 11 million people in low and middle income countries. So the advances um, in treatment and the implications for people living with HIV have been absolutely spectacular. Added to that, um, treatment is also prevention. So antiretroviral therapy 
reduces infectiousness uh, by 96%. And we discovered this in an amazing study uh, reported in 2011, showing that if you um, treated a discordant couple, one person HIV positive, the other HIV negative, you could have a profound impact on transmission. And so therefore, as we've seen more and more people on treatment rolled out across um, low and middle income countries, we've seen dramatic declines in deaths and numbers of new infections. So on the left is um, what we now see with number of new infections globally, substantial reductions. In fact, in 50 countries last year, there was a 25% reduction in new infections. And on the right is what we see with AIDS-related deaths, also very, very substantial reductions in AIDS-related deaths. We still have 2 million deaths a year from HIV, but that's rare in people who are receiving treatment. So all of this excitement has really um, led people to now raise the possibility that we could see the end of AIDS. Uh, this was the front cover of The Economist in 2011, and since that time the concept has gained enormous traction. What would it take to see the end of AIDS? And at the moment it would take finding, testing, and treating everyone with HIV and treating them long term um, for the rest of their lives. So it's an exciting prospect. There's many people in the world that think we really can do that if we can um, establish the am amount of funding to do it and uh, um, a great commitment that we really might see um, the end of AIDS in the not too distant future. So if treatment is so good, um, why are we even interested um, in thinking about a cure or um, dreaming about a cure one day for HIV. So what I'm um, going to talk to you about tonight is, uh, first of all, why we still need a cure for HIV. What are the major barriers to cure, the scientific barriers, and they're the ones that um, I work on day to day. Some of the potential strategies that are being tested currently and um, current and future challenges um, in achieving an HIV cure. So why do we need um, a cure for HIV? Well, first of all, I started off by saying that um, treatment has dramatically changed people's lives from a um, universal death sentence to a lifelong chronic manageable disease, which is true. And um, in fact, for many people now treated with HIV who start treatment, at the right time, life expectancy is in fact normal. But this um, graph shows you the life expectancy of a very large cohort of patients living in the UK uh, compared to a uh, life expectancy of people with HIV compared to life expectancy who, of women and men who are uninfected, which is shown in uh, the blue lines at the top. And uh, the coloured lines represent life expectancy based on when you start your antiretroviral treatment. And that is usually dependent on how impaired your immune function is or what your CD4 T cell count is. And the normal T cell count is 500. So if you start treatment late when your CD4 count is less than 100, shown here in brown, you can see that life expectancy remains significantly reduced. If you start treatment before your CD4 count's dramatically um, reduced, shown in the red dotted lines, your life expectancy approaches normal. But for most of the world, um, the average CD4 count when people start treatment is around 150. In Australia, it, we do much, much better because we engage people in healthcare much earlier. So life expectancy still remains reduced on treatment for a very large number of patients. We also know that even though packed drugs have really improved in their toxicity, there's still quite significant morbidity in patients on antiretroviral treatment. And this shows you why. Um, the drugs themselves have some levels of toxicity, the ongoing presence of low levels of HIV, and a state of immune activation. Or people on treatment uh, with HIV have low level chronic immune activation. And because of those three factors, we see increasing prevalence of diseases associated with ageing. And some of those are listed there, cardiovascular disease, metabolic disorders, neurocognitive abnormalities, liver disease, renal disease, bone disorders, things that we see in a, in a, in a more rapidly ageing uh, population. 
And finally, the economics. Um, for each person starting antiretroviral therapy, there is one new infection. So we still have um, at least uh, two and a half million new infections a year. At the moment, we're doing well. I told you 11 million people on treatment in low and income countries, that's, but that's only about 40% of people who need treatment are currently taking treatment. And the estimated costs of treating uh, people by 2030 is estimated to be, to be about $50 billion. So the costs are enormous, and the challenge of keeping people, particularly in low and middle income countries, in long-term health care are really significant. So if we had a way that we could convert lifelong treatment to a short period of time of treatment, say five years instead of 50 or 60 years, this could have a huge impact on the number of people that could access treatment and could really make um, us potentially get to that long-term goal of seeing the end of AIDS. So, uh, what, are the, what are the major barriers to cure and why can't um, current treatment cure HIV? So when uh, we treat people with HIV, we measure two things. We measure how much HIV is in the blood, their HIV RNA, and we measure um, CD4 count as a marker of their immune function. And when you put people on treatment, um, virus actually rapidly disappears from blood. It's quite dramatic, usually within about a month someone's virus or viral load in their blood can go from millions of copies per mil to what we call undetectable or less than current assays can detect. This originally was 50 copies per mil, now it's down to 20, 20 copies per mil. And most people, if they take their drug, stay undetectable. And at the same time, uh, this allows for recovery of immune function and in most people, if you don't start treatment too late, um, CD4 T cells come back and will reach normal levels. But once you stop treatment, um, pretty much in everyone, uh, virus rebounds in about two to three weeks. So there's always virus present in someone on treatment, even with the so-called undetectable viral load. And we've now learnt that um, there, there, there really is no such thing as an undetectable viral load. There's always virus present. Now, HIV is an RNA virus, but once it gets inside a cell, it copies itself, it re the retrovirus, it reverse transcribes and becomes DNA. And if you measure DNA, which means an infected cell, you can always find infected cells. Very, very low frequency, but they're always there in people on treatment. And if you use really better assays that detect down to one copy per mil, there's always virus present at about three to five copies per mil. So although we always tell our patients, you're fine, your viral load's undetectable, your CD4 count's good, there is no such thing as an undetectable viral load. The virus is always present there at very low levels. So of course the um, big question and, and what um, I've worked on for many years is really working out where that virus is hiding while someone um, is on treatment. And we now know that there are um, three ways that the virus can potentially hide from effective antiretroviral therapy. And the first is a concept called latency that I'll talk a little bit more about, or latently infected T cells. The second is um, low level viral replication. And the third is that the virus can hide in certain anatomical reservoirs. So what do I mean by latency? Well, latency is a very common um, mechanism that many viruses use to prolong their lives in their hosts. And what HIV does is it is able to integrate into the host genome and becomes part of someone's DNA. In fact, our DNA is full of all these ancient retroviruses. Retroviruses very similar to HIV that integrate but don't cause too much problem. In contrast, HIV can integrate and remain an infectious virus, meaning that it can come out of integration at any time. So these latently infected cells are um, generally resting memory T cells. So HIV becomes part of our immunological memory. And the memory T cells are designed to hang around for, the life, for your lifespan because they're designed to come back and fight um, infections that you may contact over your 60, 70, 80 years of life. So a very clever virus integrates into 
resting central memory T cell. So once it in, is in that cell, it's there forever. Now, the virus at any time can be released from that T cell if you activate the virus. If you actually activate the cell itself, the virus will um, again uh, be released. But in someone that's on antiretroviral therapy, that virus can't go on to infect new cells. So you just maintain the state of low-level viremia, intermittent viral release from these latently infected cells. And we also know now that these latently infected cells can proliferate or undergo homeostatic proliferation. So they're very, very durable. They basically don't decay over a lifetime of treatment. The other way that HIV can persist is that it, there's ongoing rounds of virus replication at very, very low levels. And um, so antiretroviral therapy blocks most replication, but in some patients, thought to be about a third of patients, there is very low level viral replication. That's easier to, um, to manage than long-lived lately infected cells. And finally, we know that HIV can infect unique cells in the brain, in the gastrointestinal tract, in the genitourinary tract. And um, they're often not T cells. They're other long-lived cells like monocytes and macrophages and probably contribute to long-lived persistence. <coughs> So um, we have a formidable problem. Um, retroviruses have been uh, designed to evade the immune system, become part of our host DNA and persist for the lifespan of the cell. So um, how are we going to tackle or get rid of uh, these long-lived forms of HIV? And there's really a huge amount of work being um, done at the moment uh, looking at ways we might um, achieve a cure. So first of all, uh, what, do, what do I mean by a cure? Uh, for those of us that work in infectious diseases, a cure means a cure, meaning the infection is no longer there. You've eliminated all HIV-infected cells. If you could measure down to one copy per mil, which we can, at least in, in research assays, the HIV RNA would be undetectable, less than one copy per mil. And this is now commonly referred to in the field as a sterilising cure. It's what we all want as um, physicians, is what we're all used to as um, in infectious diseases, um, but we now know is probably close to impossible with HIV. And what might be more realistic is to try and put HIV into long-term remission. So think of HIV more in a, in a cancer model so that someone would have um, long-term health in the absence of antiretroviral therapy, the viral load would virus would be detectable, but at low levels, less than 50 copies per mil, where we know your people won't get immunodeficiency, where you know you get reduced transmission. And this is now commonly referred to as a functional cure. And over the last few years, we've seen many, many reports now that um, functional cure is really um, achievable. And I think in that sense, things have really changed because although these are a handful of cases, these cases have taught us that a cure is possible. And just six years ago, it was thought that no one could ever cure HIV. And the first person that was cured of HIV um, is uh, this man here. Uh, his name is Timothy Brown, also called the Berlin Patient. And he was cured in 2009 after receiving a bone marrow transplant from a donor who was naturally resistant to HIV. The donor um, lacked a key receptor that HIV needs to enter a cell called CCR5. And I, I want to mention CCR5 because it's had a big impact in our ideas about how we might cure HIV. So he had the bone marrow transplant because he had leukaemia. And uh, bone marrow transplant is an incredibly invasive, high-risk procedure, about 25% mortality. So obviously would never be considered in someone who is otherwise healthy and taking one tablet a day. But the case of Timothy Brown taught us that um, whatever he had done, his bone marrow transplant, his conditioning therapy, his transplant with the um, CCR5 negative bone marrow led to elimination of all HIV infected cells. He's been off treatment now for five years. He has no HIV detected anywhere in blood, in brain, in the gastrointestinal tract. Um, he is the only case of sterilising cure of HIV. What has been more common are these cases of functional cure. 
And um, the one functional cure that got a lot of um, press and you may have heard about was the Mississippi baby. And the Mississippi baby was a um, baby born to an HIV-infected mother who hadn't received treatment. The Mississippi baby received anti-HIV drugs at 30 hours following birth. And then at 18 months, the, babe, the child's medicines were stopped and the virus did not come back. The virus is still detectable at low levels, but the Mississippi baby is effectively um, a great example of a functional cure. And we don't know why. Um, there's a lot of um, likely explanations being that the baby was treated very early following infection, which limited the virus getting into these hiding places of lately infected cells, anatomical reservoirs, etc. Now there's a huge amount of work uh, trying to work, trying to get other cases of the Mississippi baby. Of course, the best way to stop babies getting infected is to treat their mothers, because if you treat an HIV positive mother, you reduce the chance of the baby becoming infected to less than one percent. But many women around the world may not know that they're HIV infected at the time of pregnancy or get diagnosed at the time of delivery. And finally, the other cases of functional cure are um, patients called, which have been termed the Visconti patients. They're a group of patients identified in France who started treatment early, received treatment for three years and stopped their drugs, and the virus is still there, but at manageable low levels, and they've been off treatment for now an average of about seven or eight years. So these cases are anecdotes and um, in medicine, we always learn not to sort of put too much belief in an anecdote. You know, we want to see the evidence and reproducible interventions in large numbers of patients. But um, the, these anecdotes have been extremely valuable for um, not just for patients, giving patients hope that a cure is possible, but also inspiring a whole range of new avenues for scientific discovery. And I want to talk about some of those avenues. So um, given what we've learned from um, these cases, has that taught us anything of how you might um, eliminate lately infected cells? And there are a number of, of ways of being tested. Uh, the first is treatment during acute infection. So most people actually don't know they're infected with HIV. About 50% of people will have a glandular fever-like illness when they're infected. So treating with a acute HIV infection, reproducing the Mississippi baby or the Visconti patients could work, um, but it's only going to be relevant for a very small number um, of patients. But that's one way to eliminate latency. The other way is to um, activate latent infection. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that approach because that's an approach that we've been uh, working with for some time in both the laboratory and in clinical trials. Um, boosting HIV-specific immunity, so that's been quite a challenge. Um, the idea here is basically one of therapeutic vaccination, meaning after someone's infected to then give them a vaccine to boost immunity. Never been a great approach for most infectious diseases and has been a challenge, but potentially could work. And finally, um, stem cell transplantation or variations on what happened to the Berlin patient. Could we mimic that in a less invasive, less toxic way? So. Um, Treatment of early acute HIV infection, how might this work? Well, very early treatment could limit the number of lately infected cells. It prevents this chronic immune activation that I said happens with people with HIV. It could allow for someone to preserve good HIV-specific immunity, and that could lead to um, potentially a functional cure. And there are many studies now happening around the world, particularly fantastic studies in Thailand, where they've been able to treat people within 15 days of infection and indeed um, have shown exactly that they can dramatically reduce the number of lately infected cells. But of all the people that are treated in early um, HIV infection, it's only a small percent. Um, we don't know exactly how frequent, probably between in the range of 5 to 15 percent of people that can actually stop treatment and the virus stays under control or they have indeed achieved a functional, functional cure. The other way of um, getting, uh, tackling the problem is uh, to activate latent HIV infection and we need a way to tackle established latency because really of all the 30 5 million people in the world living with HIV, they all have established latent HIV infection. Um, 
the idea of early treatment is not going to be relevant to all those people living with HIV. So the idea um, here for activating latent HIV is a little bit counterintuitive counter because we spend our whole time as physicians looking after people with HIV, trying to suppress their viral load and stop any replication. But the idea here is that um, a latent infected cell, as I showed you before, um, a resting cell that contains integrated virus in the host DNA, effectively silent, not doing much, not visible to the immune system, not visible to any anti-HIV drugs. And the idea here is that if we could activate um, latent HIV infection and that virus started to produce RNA, started producing HIV proteins, started to producing HIV virions um, in someone that was still on treatment so that in any, any virus that emerged couldn't go on to infect new cells, this could lead to death of the cell. And it could lead to death of the cell in two ways. Um, first of all, when the, when the HIV leaves the cell, it usually self-destructs after exit from the cell. So it might um, lead to death of the cell by what we call virus-induced cytolysis or self-destruction by the virus. And the other way is that um, if we start making HIV proteins, the lately infected cell would start to become visible to the immune system because in true silent latency, any immune surveillance is not going to recognise that cell as foreign. This is now often referred to as a shock um, and kill approach. And we know um, in the laboratory there are hundreds, actually you know, every week there are a new range of compounds that come out saying that um, you can activate, uh, that can activate latent HIV infection. And, and we've worked on a number of these, um, of these drugs over many years and have a, had a long interest in this one group of drugs called histone deacetylase inhibitors. And um, they uh, activate the latent virus in an interesting way, and they were very attractive drugs to pursue because they're drugs that are already in um, advanced clinical development, largely for the treatment of malignancy. And uh, there are two HDAC inhibitors licensed for the treatment of a rare form of skin cancer, and there are many, many others in advanced clinical development. There's a whole range of other um, compounds that can activate latent HIV, cytokines such as IL-7, um, disulfiram, and which is antibuse, which we use to treat alcoholism, some antibiotics, quinolines, and then other, other compounds that alter the epigenetic environment of the chromatin where HIV sits. And um, that's been a real um, advance for us because we, HIV is really, once it's integrated, it, it functions like any host gene. Um, and in a um, host gene that's not doing much, that's transcriptionally inactive, um, the chromatin is usually tightly coiled around histones that are not acetylated, and that's basically a silence gene, and that's exactly what the HIV virus looks like in a latently infected cell. In contrast, in an actively transcribed gene or HIV that's actively replicating, um, the chromatin's opened up, uh, the histones are acetylated, and all the right transcription factors that you need to drive gene expression um, can access the uh, genetic material. And this is exactly what um, the HIV, integrated HIV genome looks like in an active productively infected cell. So by manipulating the epigenetic environment, which is now being used in, in many diseases, you can basically turn on or turn off <coughs> HIV expression. And um, histone deacetylase inhibitors, double negative, will lead to acetylation and drive um, HIV expression. So we know that it, they, they, these drugs do that in, in vitro. What about in people? Well. Um, Two years ago, we started a study at the Alfred where we gave patients on long-term antiretroviral therapy. They'd been on treatment for three years. Their viral load was undetectable, less than 50 copies per mil. They had normal T cell counts greater than 500. And we gave them this drug, Varinostat, which was the first HDAC inhibitor licensed for the treatment of 
rare form of lymphoma. And we gave them the 14-day treatment and asked the question whether we could wake up latent virus or whether we could induce HIV um, transcription from these silent proviruses. And um, this is what we found. Uh, we measured cell-associated RNA, so RNA inside an infected cell, and um, looked at how much additional HIV RNA was produced or the maximum fold change in RNA and the uh, fold change that we saw out to day 84, two months after they stopped the drug. And you can see that of the 20 patients that enrolled, um, there was very variable response in how much RNA they produced or how effectively we woke up those latently infected cells. Some patients, a 20 to 30 fold increase in cell associated RNA. Um, others, minimal or no change. And overall, about a seven-fold change in cell-associated RNA. So it was really exciting, um, this uh, re result, because we thought that latency was basically irre irreversible, and it was the first proof of concept that you could actually activate transcription um, in, a per in a person on long-term antiretroviral therapy. Very similar study was done at the same time, looking at a single dose of virinistat in the US that found um, identical results. But when we looked um, at whether we could change the number of cells, did this actually kill a lately infected cell, the results were not so good. Um, first of all, we didn't induce much virus. So um, although we could turn on um, RNA in the cell, when we measured HIV RNA in plasma, so how much virus was released into plasma, we, using a very sensitive assay that measures down to 0.3 copies per million, we actually saw no real change. And when we measured HIV DNA, the number of infected cells, we saw no change over the intervention. So um, does that mean the end of HAC inhibitors? Um, probably not. This was sort of the first um, HAC inhibitor to be tested. We gave two weeks. There are far more potent drugs now around and now um, in clinical trials. And I guess... Um, one of the issues over HDAC inhibitors is, and all of the approaches that are being used to activate latent HIV infection, is that latent infected cells are rare. They're on average about one in a million cells, maybe 60 per million cells of um, resting memory T cells contain a latent virus. And when we use a drug like an HDAC inhibitor or any of the other the drugs that are currently being looked at, you're going to have effects on every single cell. There's nothing about the HDAC inhibitor that is HIV-specific. So it's um, using a sort of very blunt instrument to target um, this one in a million cell. And um, we actually asked how significant were the changes after you gave um, Varinostat in this study. And it's a little complicated. You might not be used to looking at, um, at these sort of uh, representations of genetic changes, but this is a, micro, a heat map of a microarray study which basically looks at genes that are turned on, upregulated, uh, which uh, become red in this representation, or genes that are turned off or downregulated, um, and these appear blue. And... Um, each row is a different gene, over thousands and thousands of genes that we looked at, and each column is a different sample. Um, in green are the samples collected from nine patients before they had Varinostat, and in um, purple are the samples from nine patients that we collected two months after stopping Varinostat at day 84. And uh, what you can see is that they look very different. You know, that's essentially what the heat map shows, that all of the pre-drug samples cluster together nicely on the left, lots of blue, lots of red, and all of the post-treatment samples cluster on the right, lots of red, lots of blue. And it tells us that the genetic changes just from 14 days of drug in patients that were doing otherwise completely well, taking one tablet a day, and were very significant. We don't know what the long-term implications are of this, but at day 84, there were still very significant gene changes, which is a big issue um, when we're trying to find an intervention for someone otherwise doing really well on antiretroviral therapy. The other question was um, whether activation of virus alone is going to be enough to really cause cell death, or whether we need a second intervention that's going to kill the recently activated cell. 
There's a lot of interest and really exciting work happening in this area, and maybe what we need will be an activating agent coming in with a second agent, like a therapeutic vaccine that primes the immune system ready to kill the cell, or that um, some other way to modulate the immune system. And I just want to talk briefly about um, this molecule PD-1 because um, it's a molecule that's given us. Um, it's been really heavily investigated in both cancer immunotherapy and viral immunotherapy. And uh, for those of you that don't know much about PD-1, PD-1 basically marks an exhausted T cell, so a T cell that can no longer do its job. And um, PD-1 basically makes the T cell exhausted by binding to its receptor, um, PD-L1. And we know in patients with HIV, in patients with hep C, in patients with hepatitis B, chronic viral infections, most of our antigen-specific T cells are exhausted or expressed PD-1. It also happens in cancer as well. But we now have ways to block um, uh, PD-1 and binding to its ligand using antibodies to anti-PD-1 or antibodies to the ligand anti-PD-1. And if you block that interaction, you actually reinvigorate the T cell and it can now do its job and go out and kill its target, its HIV infected cell, hep C infected cell, cancer. And um, there have already been uh, clinical trials of anti PD1 and anti PDL1 showing really spectacular success in um, management of solid organ malignancy, pr principally um, melanoma. I got a, quite a lot of press earlier this year because a family were advocating to get anti-PD-1 for uh, one of their family members because it's still not uh, licensed and um, big bad drug company Merck wouldn't give um, anti-PD-1 and it costs a lot of money but it's got it's very effective in cancer and so um, recently um, anti-PD-L1 was tested in a monkey model of HIV um, basically um, HIV has a relative called SIV that can infect macaques the SIV-infected monkeys were given antiretroviral therapy exactly like we give humans. Um, you get very good control of the virus. And then the monkeys were given um, antibodies to this PD-L1, and then treatment was stopped and asked, did the monkeys control the virus by reinvigorating their T cells? And um, in fact, that seemed to work. This shows you what happened after the monkeys stopped their anti-HIV drugs. I mean, blue are the monkeys that received um, the antibody, and in red are the monkeys that received the control. And you can see that if you received the antibody, you could control virus much more effectively after stopping treatment. Exactly what we want to do to create um, functional cure in people. And if you looked at those people, those monkeys that could control virus, there was a subset that had really good control, keeping their virus at very low levels, exactly what we would want from a functional cure. And there's now um, studies of this molecule anti pd l one about to start um, in the US. What about um, uh, uh, transplantation? I told you about the Berlin patient, um, enormous, or Timothy Brown. Um, he's, he revealed his name shortly after the report was um, came out in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, it hasn't yet been replicated. So the transplant was done um, in 2008, and no one has been able to replicate it, not because they've tried and failed, but to get the right match for a bone marrow donor and to also be CCR5 negative. So about 1% of Caucasians lack the receptor to become infected with HIV. So that 1% are CCR5 negative. Just finding that donor has been impossible, though many people have been looking for it. So people have been asking, could um, Timothy Brown have been cured another way? Was it just, was it really the donor? I mean, here he was, he was HIV positive with leukaemia. Um, he, of course, was CCR5 wild type. His T cells expressed CCR5. He received chemotherapy and very intense total body irradiation. He received his bone marrow transplant from a CCR5 negative donor. He had something called graft versus host disease, which is a common complication of transplantation where the graft attack, attacks any residual host cells. So what really cured him? Was it um, that the donor was unique? Was it um, just having a transplant anyway? Was it the irradiation? Was it his graft versus host disease? So there's been many groups now looking at their patients who have had an 
allogeneic transplants or a transplant from an unrelated donor um, to see whether this might eliminate latently infected cells. And um, two uh, patients were reported last year in Boston, and they were patients that received some um, uh, radiation. They received a bone marrow transplant, but this time from a, a CCR5 positive wild type donor, wasn't a, a person um, resistant to HIV. And interestingly, HIV indeed disappeared from these patients' blood. Um, at six months, these patients became HIV DNA negative and HIV RNA negative while still on treatment. I told you at the beginning that you always find DNA, the RNA disappears from blood, but these patients became, as soon as they had chimerism showing that the bone, foreign bone marrow had taken over their bone marrow, they became HIV DNA negative. So um, the big question was what happened when you stopped treatment? And um, so these two patients did undergo um, a treatment interruption and um, things were looking pretty good for 12 weeks. I started by saying that when you stop treatment, most people rebound in two to three weeks. And so DNA was negative, HIV RNA was negative for 12 weeks. And then over really two days, um, the HIV rapidly rebounded. So this taught us that um, you really have to get rid of a lot of, I mean, HIV. You couldn't even measure how much HIV was there for in, order, in order to set the whole thing going again. And similarly, in the other patient, um, he managed to stay undetectable off treatment for 32 weeks, which is quite amazing. But again, over two days, went from undetectable to millions of copies of virus. Now, these patients might be unique because they've effectively got totally new immune systems which have never seen HIV before. So one or there's been some really nice modelling about this, how many viruses were needed to set this whole thing off again. Probably in the range of several hundred viruses could get the whole thing going again in the absence of any immunity. So we really don't know at the moment how, you know, how, how much virus you need to get rid of. I told you about the Mississippi baby and the Visconti patients, a little bit of virus, things are under control. But in, in these Boston patients, looked like they were cured for 12 and 32 weeks but then the virus came back. So quite, quite a difficult challenge. And finally, um, the last way um, that we might be able to cure um, HIV is making cells resistant to the virus. And um, this is work that's come from um, the Timothy Brown case. And it's using gene therapy to effectively remove certain targets like CCR5, or you can even use gene therapy or um, gene scissors, or in this case called zinc finger nucleases, to eliminate HIV itself. And um, this is how this is done. Patients with HIV on treatment will donate uh, white cells by leukapheresis, and most people's white cells will have a mixture of CCR5 positive and negative cells. Um, ex vivo, there's zinc finger modification of the CCR5, so effectively gene scissors that can cut out the gene of interest, here being CCR5. You can expand those CCR5 negative cells ex vivo and then reinfuse them back into the patient. Um, and this can be done in the presence or absence of cyclophosphamide. And um, w the first results of these trials were published earlier this year, and they showed that... Um, this was safe, and uh, that the CCR5 modified cells um, persisted in the patient. So it was quite exciting. When the patients actually underwent a treatment interruption after their CCR5 gene therapy, um, out of the six patients that had a treatment interruption, one out of the six patients um, managed to control virus, but everyone else, the virus rebounded. But um, what they learnt from here was, first of all, that you could transfer CCR5 modified cells, shown here in red, and that those cells survived and persisted even when HIV took off and started replicating during this phase when a person had stopped treatment. This is in contrast to um, the unmodified CD4 T cells that rapidly decline once you stop treatment. So. You can see that very few CCR5 modified cells were transferred, probably about 6% of total T cells, but they have a survival advantage, and that's the whole idea of this gene therapy, that you give these resistant cells a survival advantage in the presence of virus. And the idea being that if you could maybe boost this higher, 
um, you may be able to limit the number of um, targets that the virus can get into. So um, I, I uh, wanted to paint a picture of great excitement in the field of HIV, great excitement that we have great treatments and um, the possibility of ending AIDS. Um, but I don't think that's going to be done with treatment, with antivirals alone. Um, there's a lot of advances in, um, in understanding and strategies for cure, but there still really is a long way to go, and there's many, many challenges ahead. And some of these um, I've talked about, but one big one is um, what are acceptable risks and toxicities in people that are doing really well already on often one tablet a day. This is not treating leukaemia or cancer or a or a, a um, life-threatening disease anymore. It's treating someone with a chronic manageable disease. And that's a big, that raises big ethical and regulatory issues. We don't yet know how to predict who's going to control virus after they stop, people stop treatment. I showed you the Boston patients all looked very good, um, HIV DNA negative, and yet virus came back. And then we have these other cases of functional cure where low levels of virus can persist. It's a big question for the field. Um, expectations of the community are significant. You know, people really do want... Um, I often get asked this, you know, whether patients, um, you know, take one tablet a day, what's the big deal? But many patients really do want to see um, an end uh, to their HIV infection. Don't underestimate the stigma and discrimination that still exists for people with HIV. So there's a very high levels of expectations of study participants, and we're still really in these early, um, early phases of um, discovery. And that any of this work on, on cure uh, has to um, not get into the way of this argument about universal access to antiretroviral therapy, which is really what is saving lives at the moment. Um, and I, there's a lot of um, excitement in the area. There's a lot of funding going into this um, area, largely for, in the US National Institutes of Health. And so I think we're going to see the pace of um, discovery and change really accelerate in the coming years because this level of funding hasn't been available up until two or three years ago. So um, just in conclusion, I've shown you multiple but rare examples of cure and it's giving hope that sure is achievable. Um, many of what's being done is in um, early proof of concept stage. Um, I think it's unlikely that we will get cured just by reducing the size of the reservoir and enhancing immune control is um, also going to be needed. And then we have the, significant, the other great um, challenge that whatever gets discovered, you know, we really need to make sure it's um, cheap and scalable and widely available given that 80% of people with HIV um, live in low and middle income countries. So in the last few minutes, um, Stefan also asked me to talk a little bit about um, the path I've taken um, to what I do now as a clinician scientist in HIV medicine. Um, and again, I know this is sort of a very diverse uh, group in front of me, so um, excuse um, my comments to those very established investigators sitting in the audience. But um, just briefly, I did, I, I'm sort of, I did dual training. It took a long time of a medicine and a specialist training in infectious diseases. And then I did a PhD in virology um, at uh, the Burnett Institute and a postdoctoral fellowship at uh, Rockefeller University in New York. So, and I did it all sequentially, so it all took a hell of a long time. And, um, and most people sort of um, are worried about that, but I think it's the journey that's important. You know, um, it, it, I, I loved my time as a full-time clinician and I loved my time as a full-time scientist. So the, the duration of that path um, didn't hassle me too much. And I was just thinking about the, the, the things that helped um, me, at least, along the way. And um, certainly it was the passion about um, HIV itself. Um, there's no doubt that in my career, um, starting as a, um, a junior specialist um, in the early 90s to working now um, in HIV medicine, you know, the, the, the disease has just changed so, um, so enormously, enormously. There's been so many... Um, incredible uh, challenges and advances on the management of people with HIV, on understanding the science, on un new ways to prevent the virus, on dealing with all of the um, social issues around HIV in our own communities, you know, stigma and discrimination, and, um, and then the big issue about it being such a huge burden in low and middle income countries. So there was a whole lot of um, aspects of the disease itself that um, I found um, totally 
motivating and, and, and changed and has and continues to change so much as in the last 20 years and continues um, to change. So, um, you know, choose, a, choose something you're totally passionate about and will keep you interested um, for a long time. I certainly know with HIV, for me, um, it hasn't um, got dull for a second. Um, I have had uh, great mentors, and I think mentorship is a really um, key thing to um, a successful career. Uh, I started, um, I've, I've just highlighted a few mentors here, but um, Graham Brown, who I'm sure many of you know, who was the um, previous head of the Knopfler Institute, was someone that really taught me that you could do both, that um, being clinically trained and um, scientifically trained and well trained in both really gives you a great capacity to understand um, two different worlds and to try and connect those two worlds. Um, Suzanne Crow um, was my supervisor for my PhD. We still work very closely together um, at the Burnett and in fact ran the Centre for Virology um, at the Burnett together for many years. And um, Suzanne was a great role model as a clinician scientist, um, someone that learnt, asked questions from her work as a clinician and took it to the laboratory to um, answer it and, and still um, um, does um, practices in that way. And then um, in uh, New York, I had the, uh, the great opportunity when I went to do my postdoc um, to work for David Ho. I went to New York in 1997, and um, David Ho was actually Time Man of the Year in 1996 for discovering antiretroviral therapy. And um, it was an amazingly exciting place to be in the mid-90s. And in fact, my interest in cure research started then because um, the mid-90s, when antiretroviral therapy came along, and virus disappeared from blood, people thought that's the cure. We just need to keep people on treatment for three or four years. And um, of course we were wrong and, and that's really what I worked on back in the mid 90s. Um, but uh, I often tell young uh, researchers when they're doing their postdoctoral training, you know, to go overseas, um, mainly because it's just a fantastic um, life experience. There's obviously fantastic um, laboratories. You could do a postdoc here in Melbourne but um, the experience that you get, the people that you meet and um, the opportunities that will be presented and go to the best laboratory at the time is also what I recommend people. And it's really interesting to think about the, the network of um, postdoctoral researchers that were with me at that time in the late 90s in New York, all of whom are back in their countries, whether it's in Austria or China or Taiwan or... Um, or Switzerland or um, in different parts of the US and they're all running institutes or labs or this incredible network of, um, of, of, of great friends from that time we were all postdoctoral researchers together. And finally, um, mentorship never ends, I think, no matter how um, experienced or, um, or, or old you are. And I've had the opportunity to work with um, Francoise Burris in UC recently, um, Francoise uh, won the Nobel Prize for discovering HIV. She discovered it in 1983 and got the Nobel Prize in 2008. And she's very active in cure research and she's also um, the co-chair for the conference that um, we're holding here in Melbourne in July. And so I've also um, learnt uh, you know, an amazing amount uh, from someone like Francoise really just in recent years. Finally, um, science and medicine are, um, are, are team efforts and so um, I've had a great opportunity at Monash and Alfred to work with a fantastic team. This is not my lab, this is the whole department of clinicians and scientists and uh, various people and as um, Stefan mentioned, I'll be moving to the Doherty in September so looking forward to establishing that same sort of um, uh, collegial environment, because that is also part of the whole um, enjoyment of what I do. And um, that you don't have to do everything at the same time, um, you know, uh, there's constantly juggles. I, I heard um, Christine Lagarde um, answer this question beautifully, you know, she's head of the uh, World Bank, and uh, the IMF, and she um, has had this amazing career and she's, she's got two children and when she was asked the question of, you know, what sacrifices has she made in her family life, given her career? She answered that, she, that different things take on different priority at different times in your life. And I think uh, specifically for young women in the audience, that's um, really true, that at certain times of your career, no matter how, um, how much equality we get, um, still it will have a big impact on women having children. And maybe at those, at those, at those times, you know, you don't need to be working... Uh, 
24/7 or five days a week, or you know, you will adjust your work hours. And I and I've done that um, over my um, career. And um, of course, my children have also and husband have enjoyed lots of the opportunities um, that science has allowed. Working in um, New York and uh, and subsequently later sabbatical in Paris. So that's you know that that um, there's no big rush. There's no big rush to get through, and you know I said that at the beginning about um, doing science and medicine, and it's the same thing with how you juggle all the other um, things we do in life. So finally, just to acknowledge uh, many of the people that um, have worked on um, some of the studies I showed you, uh, so, um, certainly um, Julian Elliott at the Alfred, who led the clinical trial of Arinostat, um people um, from my group, particularly Fiona Whiteman and Ajanta Solomon, who have worked with me for many years, who did a lot of the virology and immunology, and um, funders, uh, including the NHMRC, uh, the National Institutes of Health, American Foundation for AIDS Research and Merck, um, who sponsored the trial. And uh, finally, for those of you, um, particularly med students or science students, um, who are interested in HIV, uh, we are holding a um, very big conference, first international conference, first time the International AIDS Conference has come to Australia. It will be held here in Melbourne in July. Um, we're expecting 14,000 people. Um, it's a fascinating conference because it gives you that really big mix of what HIV is all about, the science, the medicine, the advocacy, the leadership, and, um, and there is a very good volunteer program should you want to um, get involved. And hopefully I'll see you there. And I've got a few minutes for questions. Thanks very much. Any quick questions before we wrap up um, for Sharon? Yeah, yeah. I, I, um, I, th I think a work and a cure is sort of an investment in the future. You know, you've all, every, every, you've got to constantly try and improve what you're doing, and um, lifelong treatment for everyone who needs it is unlikely to be um, feasible. So we need to find a way out of that bind. But I totally agree. It can't interfere with the messages around prevention messages around getting tested and the messages around how good treatment is and um, if we had enough money we would just um, treat everyone for life you know that would that's, and we should still be working hard to make sure that treatment's accessible so I, I, I really strongly um, agree with that idea that we can't mix the messages but that doesn't mean we don't stop innovating or don't stop finding new solutions because what we've got now is not perfect it's quite a difficult model Any other questions? One more, maybe? Roger. Um, I'm speaking about 